All right, so our scripture passage today is coming from Philippians, the second chapter, verses 12 through 13. So I invite you to follow along in your Bibles that you have with you or listen to the word as it is read. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So for me, make sure I've got this on. I'm on. Okay. Growing up, <clears throat> I was very fortunate that my family took me to church. Okay? It was one of those things that I knew that most Sunday mornings, that's where we'd be headed. I remember one time, one Easter, that I was so excited about my Easter basket because my mom always kind of overdid Easter. She, that was her thing. Um, I was so upset that I was going to church. Man, I got a scolding because that was Easter Sunday. Like, you're going to church. This is the most important one of the year. You can play with your stuff when you come back. But growing up, though, I never really thought about it until I got older, but the types of churches that my mom and dad took me to, and, and why. We lived in Jackson in the 80s, and then like many families in the early 90s, we left and moved off to what was Madison County, which wasn't much there, but now is full of stuff, because that's just what happens in Madison. But when we were in Jackson, we went to Wells, United Methodist Church. That's where my family had their anchor there. My grandmother went there, my uncles went there, um, and so we went there, all right? and received a lot of great teaching and preaching at Wells. We came to Madison, and we checked out St. Matthew's. I remember checking out St. Matthew's a little bit, and we checked out all these other churches. But in the mid-'90s, there was a new church that was going to be formed, and it was called Parkway Hills United Methodist Church on Highland Colony Parkway. And the preacher there was Reverend Bruce Taylor, and I remember he must have been doing just some neighborhood stops and knocking on doors. Because I remember him knocking on the door, coming on in, sitting down in my living room, and just talking to my parents about this new church that they were starting. And so we started to attend Parkway Hills United Methodist Church. And at that time, we were meeting not in a building that was the church's building, but in the high school commons area of Madison Central. And so I remember going to church in the commons of a high school. And that's where we made our, our home here for, for a church in Madison. And then over time, that church grew, obviously. Uh, they did a capital campaign, built a building right across the street. And I remember that first Sunday where we started worship in the commons, and then we got on the road, and we walked all the way over to the new building, and it was hot. I remember that. But we, we made our home there. I did youth group there. I did a lot of things there that really formed my faith. One thing that I do remember is that I went through confirmation with Bruce Taylor, he was the pastor at the time that we didn't really have a youth minister per se, so he kind of led it, and it was just me. <laughs> I was the youth. That was it. So I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention with him. And he would take me to Dairy Queen in Ridgeland on 51, and that's where we did our confirmation lesson. So it was over a hot fudge Sunday at Dairy Queen, and I learned that's what he really liked. That's why we went there. Um, and so it was a wonderful experience, and I was not baptized as an infant, so through confirmation, I decided that I was going to be baptized, and our family was going to formally join the church in that moment, and we learned that my dad, when they did some research, he was never baptized. We always assumed he was, but we did some research, asked my grandmother, so my dad, my older sister, and I were all three baptized on Confirmation Sunday at Parkway Hills. And... Later in life, I was talking to my parents about why did we choose, like, United Methodist churches? You know, why didn't we join a Baptist church or another denomination? And my mom's answer was, I always loved it when we left the United Methodist church that I felt uplifted and that the message of grace was preached. I, my whole life, have heard grace preached from the pulpit, but never thought of it. But for my mother, she thought that was important for us as children to hear that message for whatever reason, was the message of grace. And that's what I heard at Wells. That's what I heard at Parkway Hills. 
And that is why a lot of my preaching, when I preach and visitors come, they say, that was a very graceful message. But my whole life, I have never known anything different than God's grace and how that works in our lives and how that is important in our lives. And so what we're doing here at St. Matthew's, what Andy and I are working through on this sermon series, is a series called The Marks of the Church. And in June, we looked at the big church, Church Universal, what those marks are. But now we're focusing directly at us. What are some of the marks of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church? And today's focus is Wesleyan. Is Wesleyan. Now, we hear the word Wesley a lot. If you paid attention to your hymns, a lot of them have Wesleyan roots. Okay, John Wesley, who is the main theologian, the the father of of the Methodist movement, okay, his brother wrote a lot of hymns. And so we have those hymns in our hymnal. We're singing some Charles Wesley hymns. We're trying to drive home what it really means and what it is to be Wesleyan, what it means to be that here at St. Matthew's. That is the focus. And as Brett said in his children's moment, he focused a lot on what grace means. Grace. Something that we really don't deserve, but yet God gives to us. And John Wesley had a lot to say about grace. And it is one of the marks of being a Methodist, is grace. And as I said, it's what I heard all throughout my childhood and what a lot of my messages are. Now, grace is also when it's not that we don't acknowledge sin. It doesn't mean we don't acknowledge that we're not perfect. But what it is, in part, is us acknowledging that we have a good God. That while we deserve punishment, while God has the right to start over with creation, He doesn't. He gives His creation grace for where we fall short. And I remember when I was going through my confirmation classes, and when we teach confirmation here, what John Wesley says about grace is one of the main focal points of that time of confirmation, when you're learning about your own faith, when you're learning about the United Methodist Church and what that means. And so John Wesley, in his sermon, and as a good Methodist preacher, we're supposed to know all of John Wesley's sermons and read them and all of that, right? So, but in his sermon, sermon number 43, okay, it's the scripture way of salvation where John Wesley dives into and touches on these three areas or on these ways of grace that we all live through. And so there is a grace that he touches on and that we teach in confirmation called prevenient grace. Okay, so this is going to be a little teachery, but how many of y'all have heard of prevenient grace? Okay, there's my Methodist out there. Very good. That is the grace that goes before us. Okay, that is the grace that gets you wooed over, as they say, it woos you over to salvation, to your understanding of what Jesus Christ did for you and for us with his sacrifice, okay? And so prevenient grace is the grace that goes before. It's the grace that's there when we don't know it's even there, okay? Is God's grace ever present? And John Wesley touches on this prevenient grace. They use it as an uh, illustration a lot of the house model, where prevenient grace gets you to the front door of the house, okay? It gets you to that moment where you realize God's working in your life, when you realize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you realize what all this is starting to mean for you. And then you get to this next grace called justifying grace, the moment where you accept Jesus Christ, and the moment that you fully understand God's grace and what he has done for us as sinners. So that gets you through the door, of the house, okay? And that is your justifying grace. And then you have what's called the sanctifying grace. This continual grace working in your lives, trying to perfect your heart. Um, There's a question they ask United Methodist preachers, are you driving on towards perfection? Do you believe you can obtain perfection? And at first, I always had issues with that because I'm like, we're not perfect. Jesus was perfect. He was perfect. He was without sin. But what this means is in this sanctifying grace moment, when you're perfecting your heart, it means you're driving on towards perfect love. 
that, that you believe that there can be a moment where you have perfect love, where you love neighbor and love God, and you live that out in your lives. And that sanctifying grace gets you there. It's that purifying, that constant working on you where you mess up and then God's grace, you can come back. And you mess up and you can come back, okay? And that is something I think is very important for all of us to fully understand as we look through these marks of the church. As I said earlier, because we have this theology on grace, it doesn't mean we don't acknowledge sin and brokenness because it's there, and one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that we're not perfect and we're broken. But the other thing is we don't stop there. We don't stop there because we know of God's grace, of God's love for us, and it gives us a fresh start each and every day. And that is the message that I heard all of my life is that, yes, I know I'm going to mess up, but I have hope of the God of this world, that he sent his son to die for me and for you, and that while we're not perfect, he believes in us, and that his grace goes with us as we are going on in perfect love. That is the message that we have. That is a mark of being Wesleyan, is God's grace. But something else that John Wesley really believed in, too, is that he believed that this was a serious decision when you decide to become a Christian and acknowledge God's grace that wooed you there, that justified and sanctified you, that this is not just a, a light decision to make. And this goes to another mark of us being Wesleyan, is that he believed in discipleship. He believed that this is an important moment that maybe you just need to walk around and contemplate this before you dive in into this whole system that we have here, and this whole religion of Christianity because it is an important decision not to accept lightly. Because of what God's sacrifice is, it was a big sacrifice. And so the mark of discipleship is something else as Wesleyans that we believe in. That here at St. Matthew's we believe in. We have great Sunday school classes. We have great Sunday school teachers. We have great classes because we know the importance of of Scripture and teaching it. But we also know the importance of community and fellowship. And our Sunday school classes as a discipleship avenue here at the church fill many roles. It's a mark of being Wesleyan. Also, I'm plugging Sunday school classes. If you're not in one, see me. We'll plug you in, okay? But being a mark of Wesleyan is discipleship. It's constant reading of Scripture, being in community, acknowledging God's grace, but then what do we do with all of that, right? What do we do with all of that? Well, we don't just keep it in these walls of the church. To be a church and to be a successful church and a church of note, you have to make an impact in the world in which you live, or then what are you doing? If you do not go out beside these physical walls with God's grace then what are we doing? We need to do something else. But being Wesleyan is also going out in the world, living out the great commission of making more disciples of Jesus Christ. That is what we're charged with. We are charged by Jesus to go out and make more disciples. Can we do that just sitting down in this building? No. I challenge us to go out. And live out the Great Commission, sharing that message of love and grace. Of love and grace. We live in a world today where it's a zero-sum game. We live in a world today, as Brett said, well, I'm going to do this to you because you did it to me first, right? I mean, I know kids do that, but come on, as adults we do that too, right? We feel like we can counteract somebody or say something negative about somebody because they said it about us first. But I charge us, as we go out and live the Great Commission, as we go out in love, as we go out in love and grace, it's kind of countercultural. But we have to go out. That is a mark of this church. We have many great avenues in this church for you to go out and share the love and grace. To go out, buy school supplies for kids in need. 
Go out and help somebody with their academic year. Go out and help a family so they don't have to decide between school supplies or food on the table. Go and join our foreign mission team. Go to Honduras. Build homes. Give medical care. Build relationships with people from a different country. You will be blessed just as much as they are. But that's a mark of being Wesleyan, of going out and sharing that grace. We're not going out to condemn the world. That's not our job. I don't want that job. That's God's job to judge. It's our job to go out with love and grace and make disciples, to live as Jesus lived. We are called his ambassadors. When you think of an ambassador of a country, they represent that country and their beliefs. You are ambassadors. I am an ambassador. We are to go out representing Jesus Christ and what we say and what we do. And we know that with the foundation of God's love and grace. We go out and make disciples in that way. And so this is something I think as a church we need to call ourselves back to. We need to be reminded of this, of this is who we are. This is one of our marks of being a local church. Andy threw a lot of big words at you last week about being orthodox, okay? I'm not doing that today. The message that I bring to you today is as you work out your salvation, not meaning that you have to go and earn it. Jesus Christ did that on the cross. But when you work out your salvation, as Paul says, you go out and you live it. You perfect it. It's that sanctifying grace. And that is something that we need to be reminded of, is that we are called to go out, to work out our salvation with respect to the Lord and what he has done for us as grace-filled people, as thankful people, people of hope, people of love and grace, people who go out and make disciples. And that's who we are. That is our charge in our community. That is why we're here. That is why you come to church. That's why you come to hear sermons. And that's why you come to go to Bible studies. And you do all these wonderful ministries. It's because of God's grace we're able to go out and make more disciples. So St. Matthews, are you ready? Are you ready? And do you fully know what God's grace means in your life? I believe we are. And that's why I'm excited about what God is calling us to do. Excited about what we have here. Excited for the blessings that we've been given. Because I know this world desperately needs to hear that message of love and grace. God's grace. May we go out boldly and live it. Let's pray.